Welcome to tonight's edition of Tisky Sour. I'm Michael Walker, and tonight I'm delighted to be joined live from New York City by Michael Brooks, host of The Michael Brooks Show and author of the upcoming book, Against the Web, a cosmopolitan answer to the new Right Out with Zero books next month. Thanks for joining us, Michael. How are you doing? It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. And, uh, you know, I mean, look, incredibly lucky uh, in my personal circumstance, no doubt about it. Uh, but the broader atmosphere is really anxious. And, uh, you know, the, the disease is very close. And, mm. uh, you know, so getting through. I mean, we'll, we'll get you on to talk about your, your book sometime soon. But obviously today, the only topic on everyone's lips is, is coronavirus on both sides of the Atlantic. I'm also joined by Aaron Bastani uh, from England's South Coast. How are you doing? Very good. How are you doing? Uh, I'm fine, yeah. Good. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm Michael kind of, Brooks on. Uh, uh, yeah, no, it's sick, yeah. We need to do more of these crossovers. Absolutely. Um, our main topic tonight is going to be the impact of coronavirus in the US and what it's like to have your health in the hands of Donald Trump. Many of our many of our audience would have been, you know, feeling rather uncomfortable over the last two weeks that it, we had Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings in charge. Um, but you know, I'd I'd hate to be you right now, I suppose, Michael, because uh, <laughs> your guy's fucking more nuts than our one. Uh, but first of all, we're going to briefly mention today's stories from the UK. In the last 24 hours, the UK death toll from coronavirus rose by 181. That's the biggest increase. Um, daily so far by quite a way. Of course, we send our solidarity to the friends and family of those whose lives this virus has taken. Um, the announcement from Downing Street's daily press conference uh, today, they, they happen every day at 5 p.m. today, it was that next week frontline NHS staff will have access to coronavirus tests. Now, obviously, that's good news. Uh, the fact that that is being announced a few weeks into a coronavirus crisis or three months into a coronavirus crisis is, you know, outrageous and, and the government should never be forgiven for that. Um, this week, Germany did four times more COVID-19 tests than the UK has done during this entire crisis. Um, so we're on the back foot and that's not a scientific fact. That's that's something that's a result of political decisions that have been made over the previous years. Um, the government not bothering to prepare us for a pandemic. There was a story in The Guardian today, in fact, about uh, a, a scientific advisory board which had advised the Tory government back in 2017 that they needed to invest in eye equipment, personal protective equipment, uh, glasses for doctors and nurses. They decided it was too expensive, which is why now um, we had a story yesterday about when doctors are being told that if someone spits or coughs near their eye, they should just close them. Um, finally, um, and probably you know the, the most headline-grabbing story of the day from the UK, is that Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Health Secretary Matt Hancock have both tested positive for coronavirus. They've been in self-isolation since yesterday, but say they will be continuing in their roles from home. We can watch a brief clip now of Boris Johnson announcing that news earlier. Hi folks, I want to bring you up to speed with something that's happening today, which is that I've developed mild symptoms of the coronavirus, that's to say a temperature and a, a persistent cough. And on the advice of the chief medical officer, I've taken a test that has come out positive. So I am working from home. I'm self-isolating. Aaron, what, what do you make of this? Is it significant that the prime minister has got COVID-19? Is this, is this a, a unique moment in British government or is it kind of a non-story and he can just do it from Skype at home? Well, I wouldn't say it's a non-story. I mean, the fact that you've got the chief medical officer, uh, the prime minister and the health secretary all doling out advice as to minimise contagion uh, and then all three of them get it. I mean, that's not been confirmed with the chief medical officer, uh, but it's been confirmed with the health secretary and prime minister. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing. You know, their job was over the last several weeks to minimise the spread of a virus and yet they have it. Uh, so no, it doesn't. It doesn't inspire confidence. Do you think it's going to be embarrassing? I think this is something they're really going to. I think this is going to be good for them. I mean, it, it it does present this image of we're all in it together. Obviously, Boris Johnson and Matt Hancock have both made, uh, you know, selfie videos from home. Mm. Um, and I suppose their claim was never that you only get coronavirus if you're irresponsible. So I mean, I think from a PR perspective, this isn't this isn't bad for them. Um, well, it, it, I, I mean, no, no, no. Look, it, <laughs> We've just had 180 people die. I mean, at the moment, people are very, you know, getting behind. Nobody wants them to be sick. But if we do start to see numbers approaching Italy-style levels, there will be 
anger directed towards political decisions which were made weeks ago that might not be expressed in the next month or two. And it shouldn't be, by the way, generally speaking. But in six months, a year's time, people will say, my God, they were so reckless. And part of that was they even got this themselves. So, I mean, uh, look, this is a big story, COVID-19. You can't analyze it on a day-to-day, -day, a week-to-week -week basis. These are really historic events right now. So I, I don't quite buy that. Uh, I think there'll be goodwill to them as long as the numbers don't get really bad. Uh, and tragically, I think they're going to get quite bad. I think they're going to get particularly bad in the United States. I think it's more of an issue for Donald Trump, as we'll talk about later on. But yeah, I, I, the idea of it's going to play well PR, the PR that matters, the public relations that matter, are going to be in six months a year from now, not not this weekend. It's going to be comparing deaths from one country to another, which is you know the very clear and obvious way that you can compare how different governments have fared um, in this you know particular struggle. Although, to be honest, you should also take into account how much warning they had. So, for example, Italy is going to have much higher numbers than than many other places, mm. presumably. But they were, sorry, they were, you know, taken to some degree by surprise. Let's move to New York. Um, New York State is the epicenter of coronavirus in the US. Um, as of today, there have been 519 deaths from COVID-19 in that state alone, 134 in the last 24 hours. Um, so it is sounding pretty, pretty grim over there. Yeah, I mean, there's it's absolutely grim. Everything about it is grim. Um, you know, it's it's a term I'm kind of tired of using, uh, but hypernormalization would really fit the moment in the sense that this is this is an acceleration of what we already do. I mean, we've been gutting and hacking away at any basic kind of infrastructure of public health in this country for decades. I remember reading a book that came out in 2000, I believe, by a woman named Lori Jarrett called Betrayal, which was about the collapse of global public health networks. And you can very easily fit that inside the neoliberal story that we tell all the time. And this is what happens. I mean, this, you know, this is how we have this incredibly wealthy, over leveraged country that has completely devastated and decimated its own infrastructure. And of course, the weight falls on the poor. It's a disgusting, familiar story. And, you know, a hyper expression of what we already do here, right? I mean, tens of thousands of people do die a year uh, in non-emergency circumstances because they don't have health care in this country, or for, in fact, they're underinsured, right? I, I think the other things that are interesting about this and disturbing are, look, on one hand, there's a certain degree of advantage in some of the decentralization of the United States. Governors can override Donald Trump's talking points in terms of what they recommend with regard to self-isolation, as an example. Now, federal delivery is an entirely different thing, using something like the Defense Production Act, where you mandate uh, that companies produce ventilators and things like that using uh, you know, something like a GM factory and say, okay, we're not going to do cars right now. We're going to do uh, vital services. Donald Trump has actually signed that order, but he's not enforced it uh, at the behest primarily of the Chamber of Commerce, who sees a great opportunity for its clients to price gouge, which they're doing right now. Um, so, you know, you, you have this, but, but even in that context, I just want to say, I mean, Andrew Cuomo is doing quite, you know, he's I wouldn't be surprised if the move is to replace Biden with him as a Democratic nominee, frankly. Uh, but as of a couple of weeks ago, I mean, he was still on an aggressive Medicaid cutting uh, hospital shutdown binge. So, you know, th this cuts across um, most of the kind of centers of our politics. And then the other main thing is we, you know, the Senate and the House, I believe the House just did just now a, a massive bailout package, which is you know, a, a pittance for people, a necessary pittance. And then primarily it's the next phase of absolute consolidation of wealth and power in this country. And I'll just add one other thing briefly on top of that, which is I, I think this rhetoric of overturn window and the sort of shifting ideological kind of stance of the country, the left uses that as sort of a bedtime story in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, okay, well, Bernie's losing, but look, 60% of these primary voters support single payer. I, I think that, well, look, the, the very 
depressing truth is that more people will migrate or be open to our positions because the conditions are so horrific. And of course, there is a, we wouldn't be all doing what we were doing if we didn't think that public opinion and ideology and ideas didn't matter. Absolutely. But what you see in this bill and in this, in this bailout is really just, we're at the raw power phase of everything. It, you know, even in contrast to 2008, there really wasn't. I mean, there was some very basic Keynesian ideas, some of which actually did wind up in the Obama stimulus, but the ideological terrain was incredibly narrow. We do have a bigger ideological terrain now, and this bailout is actually arguably worse than 2008, and it's because, uh, you know, the, the companies run the show. We're going to go through all of these things in detail as the show goes on. We've got a section on Cuomo versus Trump and on that that bailout bill you're talking about now. First of all, I just want to know, how are you doing? I mean, are you in lockdown? How long have you been stuck in your house? Oh, well, uh, I was going to make a joke about being outside running and everything else. But no, I mean, we've, we've been taking it pretty seriously, uh, basically not leaving the apartment for a couple of weeks. I mean, you know, you still have to go to the grocer. You still have to navigate some things. You have to... Uh, you know, uh, most of my family is out of state. Uh, so there's a lot of different moving pieces of things to pay attention to. Uh, but look, I mean, you know, it, and it's very stressful and tough and everything. But obviously, uh, so far, it's been incredibly lucky, um, even just being able to keep, you know, doing shows and working. Mm -hmm. um, I, no doubt. So but, you know, because we all, in fact, are connected to each other, that's an expression of our politics. Uh, this is horrible. And anytime you hear an ambulance, I was saying before we went on, you can literally hear the emergency spiking, right? I mean, so it's a, it's a, it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a fraught moment. Personally, I, I certainly consider myself quite lucky. I want to go through uh, specifically Donald Trump's relationship to coronavirus for a while. And I mean, I think one of the reasons this has been very interesting to watch from a British perspective is that over here, it, it was very clear that about two weeks ago, there was a debate going on in private among you know Boris Johnson and his advisors about the extent to which one should prioritize the economy over public health and, you know, how how many how many how, how big a hit you could take to to the stock market um, to rescue, you know, in a, a few pensioners in in Dominic Cummings, uh, you know, words, according to a piece in the Sunday Times that we talked about on a, on a previous show. That's happening super publicly in the United States with a partisan dimension. And Donald Trump has quite, you know, explicitly and dramatically taken the side of let's let the economy continue um, regardless of the body count. We're going to go now to a video of him calling in um, to Sean Hannity last night on Fox News. And I am one that wants to get everybody back working. And, you know, that was important. People were saying, oh, we'll take three or four or five months. And everybody said, three or four months? You know, our country is, is not designed for that. And our people aren't designed. We're not engineered for that, Sean. We're, we're, everybody wants to go back to work. So, you know, people, they own a restaurant. They can't keep their restaurant closed for months. By the way, the sooner we go back, the better the, the lift that we're going to get. I think we're going to have a bounce. That was Donald Trump saying that, you know, we can't stay at home. We can't slow down the economy for three months. Um, and that if we, if we send people back to work super quick, we'll get a huge bounce um, on the stock market. I want to go to the next video, which tells us the specific time frame Donald Trump has in mind as to when American society and the economy can all go back to normal. By the way, but online is never going to be like being there. So I think Easter Sunday and you'll have packed churches all over our country. I think it would be a beautiful time. And it's just about the timeline that I think is right. It gives us more chance to work on what we're doing. And I'm not sure that's going to be the day, but I would love to aim it right at Easter Sunday. So we're open for church service and services generally on Easter Sunday. That would be a beautiful thing. <laughs> Easter Sunday, in case you, you, you're not observant, is in 16 days. I mean, this is insane, right? They can't, they can't, he's not going to be able to do this. He's not going to be able to open up American economy and society in 16 days. Uh, it's a study from NYU called uh, Brilliant Timeline, opening by Easter Sunday. Uh, it's a new epidemiology, uh, a, new, a new medical study from NYU. But no, 
Yeah, but again, this is another thing that we need to complicate a little bit. Uh, I read my first full Thomas Friedman column in years just a couple of days ago, not just to have a laugh and, you know, do some sort of uh, layup content on the show to make fun of, but really look at what is the upmarket version of this argument? You know, Lord, Lloyd Blankfein tweeted out about getting people back to work the other day, and Thomas Friedman's entire column uh, is doing the you know, middle brow New York Times version of a very similar argument and even more cynically, frankly, than Trump actually, you know, couching it in the language of liberal concern. You know, well, what will the cost be for poor people and and so on? Uh, and so, you know, there there is this and the only word is sadistic element to everything that's happening. So I I think, no, he can't get the whole country to open up and go to normal in a couple of weeks. And I'm sure plenty of governors will ignore this. And there's a fight inside the administration. But the bigger reality is that it has become an acceptable talking point amongst certainly the Republicans. You have the lieutenant governor of Texas explicitly talking about grandparents being willing to sacrifice their lives uh, so that people can get back to work. And you also have, uh, you know, this sort of New York Times uh, uh, mental zone, at least represented by Thomas Friedman, uh, with a lot of caveats and a lot of expressions of concern and hand wringing. But I mean, I, I can't help but I believe his wife's fortune comes from a chain of uh, of, of, of malls and foot lockers, I believe. So, you know, <laughs> it's easy to be very cynical. And I think probably we should be very cynical. So. I think this is, the, again, another very common problem in American politics is Donald Trump is going to be the most ludicrous and he is going to be the most obscene. But how much of a, how outside of the box is he really? And unfortunately, not that much. Uh, and, and then the other, you know, just sort of two practical things, obviously, and you saw this in the UK, this idea that you can somehow isolate people very easily as if they don't live in towns, they don't live in communities, they don't have family members around them. We can just find who's vulnerable and isolate them. I mean, first of all, it would require a level of coordination and logistics that absolutely doesn't exist in the United States, as well as social and medical infrastructure, which doesn't exist. And the other thing is that, you know, this beautiful bounce and recovery he wants uh, is obviously going to be even uh, worse because it will just increase the death rate. But, I, you know, I've come to accept, uh, you know, this is who's president and we need to understand, even in this context, frankly, I mean, he's in the mid fifties approval rating wise. And what is the combination of complete and utter failure in response to him and where people will express the same ideas in more, you know, sort of, uh, respectable ways. I mean, you mentioned before how you know the impact of Donald Trump is is partly mediated by the governors in in different states. Is it possible that we're going to see you know a uh, a grand kind of macabre social experiment now, whereby Texas decides to go for you know what was called herd immunity in the UK for a while, which means you sort of just let everyone get it and hope that it passes quite soon, and New York having a lockdown? Like, could could, could we see all the different states taking a different stance towards coronavirus with dramatically different death rates and, and economic outcomes. Well, I think we already kind of see that. I mean, Florida was way behind. I mean, Florida was still, you know, was having students come to like party at Miami Beach. Um, and I, you know, it, I'm not interested in blaming any individual behavior, but that was like an extreme, extreme outlier. That's not people, you know, being obligated to go to work because there's no infrastructure for them to survive. That's people going to party. Uh, and the governor of Florida is still resisting uh, much more aggressive action. Then there's also the contextual, uh, you know, uh, that we've been alluding to, right? There's the overall collapse of infrastructure, but there's even the difference between states that took Obamacare Medicaid expansion versus those that didn't. So on one hand, I do think, well, and, and then, you know, conversely so far, if we want to split it that way, California and New York so far are hardest hit, and those are democratic states. Uh, and then, you know, there's, there's, of course, the other truth, which is that, you know, we are all interdependent and we're not solidified by ball, uh, bars, you know, by, by borders across, uh, you know, the 50 states. So 
it's going to affect all of us. The last thing to mention too is because of the price gouging, you have uh, states competing across state lines for ventilators, masks, uh, and other uh, vital needs. I mean, this is actually, you know, a time, frankly, where uh, Aaron, I'll plug your book. We need to practically experiment with some of those ideas because people actually do need to see if they can decentralize 3D printing as an example, as a matter of serious urgency to get medical supplies. And then, by the way, we'll see if, uh, you know, these companies don't try to stop that process with intellectual property claims. Yeah, I think as well. I mean, we've not mentioned it yet. Uh, obviously, the, the new unemployment claims that came up in the US yesterday, I think 3.28 million people, new unemployment benefit claimants. I mean, when you saw that number, I mean, people were saying, speculating two and a half million, which in and of itself would obviously be unprecedented. Bigger than 1987, bigger than the early 90s, bigger than the global financial crisis, bigger than the Wall Street crash. But, but 3.28 million figure, can can you sort of walk our audience through what, what that means? And if there was another week as bad as that, I mean, how does that become politically manageable for the White House? Well, that's the, the I'll take the second part first. I mean, it, it won't be politically manageable. So even this catastrophic, disgusting bailout we just had, they're going to do more of them. And it's going to be this, this same kind of dribbled out process where, there's always going to be something more that the lo lobbyists want. There's always going to be, you know, I mean, th this bill we're going to be reading for months. We'll find out that the the Mars Corporation got a candy incentive. Uh, you know, we'll find out every, you know, Boeing is saved because of national security. That will go on and on and on. And there will be these kind of continuous increments uh, of, of things like, uh, you know, beefed up unemployment benefits and so on, because it's completely untenable. I mean, the whole thing will collapse and you will see mass public discontent uh, and rage in a way that we're not used to in the United States. And in fact, I want to say in a positive sense, it is already happening. I mean, you're seeing, uh, I've been someone who really has resisted call, you know, the sort of rhetoric of things like general strikes for a long time, because while I think it would be fantastic, I think we can't have this sort of, um, you know, we, we can't romanticize our political tactics. And as the left, we should not write checks we can't cash, uh, ironically to use that phrase. Hmm. In this context, it, people are doing it. They're walking, I mean, these workers we just walked off of a Purdue plant in Kathleen, uh, uh, Georgia. Uh, the sanitation workers in Pittsburgh, there's insurrection at Amazon warehouses. I actually think in some respects, the question now starts to become one, it's just an undeniable body blow and threat to the economy, and there'll be a continued federal response. Two, this is just going to be the next layer of really illustrating just how stark things are, first and foremost, obviously, between the one and the 99%, but even, say, the 20 versus 80%, uh, you know, where the economy, and, and, and I think a constructive question, and I don't know how possible it is, is to make concepts and conversations of things like mutual aid practical, both for neighbors to be in text messages and exploring things like rent strikes. I'll be careful how I phrase that, but I would strongly urge exploring things like that. And also, you know, and I don't know how we do it, but you know, how do we send pizzas to people who've walked off of job sites? I mean, there, there is that moment, and I'm not saying this to kind of even the bad with the good. I just want us to see the whole terrain. Um, and so there, there is some, and it's horrible because it's like by necessity, uh, good things will happen because people are going to say, I'm not going to die for dominoes, you know, I mean, right. And so, and, and I also think policymakers are very, very aware of that. And I think that's the other push and pull in the United States. I mean, you don't, you don't want to get too overly theoretical here, but it's very obvious that on some level, the reason that there isn't this kind of comprehensive and obvious social democratic measures like Rashida Tlaib just saying, give everybody a preloaded debit card, give them $2,000 a month for the year, ensure, you know, beef up hospitals. I mean, we, we could take care of this very easily in a way that will allow people to do what they need to do to stop the virus from spreading. And I think that, you know, there's no doubt a component that they don't want to do that because then the expectation set will rise. And can so, I, you know. Can I ask another two questions? Is that all right? Quick questions. Um, to what extent do you think the federal kind of safety net can can uh, act as a shock absorber? So in, in the Europe, you know, European Union, in Britain, I mean, we're 
significantly behind um, significantly behind other countries in the Nordics, for instance, or, or France or the Netherlands or Germany in terms of how we look after people out of work. But actually, broadly speaking, the, the response fiscally in terms of welfare has been pretty similar in, in most countries. Uh, I, I, you know, that, that, that's reassuring in a sense, actually, the kind of default of European politics is that actually still quite coherent. Uh, but obviously, America doesn't really have that experience of a, of a welfare safety net, certainly not across 50 states. Yeah, one or two, as we've already sort of hinted at, maybe one or two states might do quite progressive measures. Uh, but generally speaking, that, that won't be the case. So how does that work? I mean, how do you have 20%, 15% unemployment and the absence of a federal safety net? And almost always, historically, the argument would be, well, you get them back to work. But obviously, in a pandemic economy, the whole point is demobilizing the economy. Uh, so do you have an inkling as to how that might be resolved by federal government? Would it just be police, violence? Or or are they to uh, that is this such a shock to them that you don't think there's been the formulation of a of a response to maintain public order, supply chains, et cetera? Well, the supply chain, is, that's an interesting question. I mean, uh, that may be a little bit separate, um, but I think that the welfare question and social safety net question is, I think it will be a combination of three things. And I think we need to be very scared and very concerned about another clawback of civil liberties. Um, I don't know the state of it now, but last week, uh, the Bill Barr DOJ was floating a motion that that judges could keep people in pretrial uh, detention indefinitely um, in times of quote unquote emergency. So that's an enormous threat. Uh, the second thing is, again, I th there, there are these sort of piecemeal things that the federal government does have. And my sense is, is again, as I think in two months, maybe even, you know, maybe even a little bit less, they'll do another, okay, let's, let's, let's give out a bit more unemployment insurance. Let's maybe we'll stop trying to cut food stamps. Let's, I, I think it's really this push pull of what is an absolute bare minimum to not collapse the stock market and completely dissolve everything with the fact that, you know, this is not going to be an opportunity to, to really invest in a social safety net. And that comes from Republicans as well as the leadership of the Democratic Party. Uh, third, and maybe more related to, to supply chains, this is a moment where, you know, the left needs to have a narrative about localism in general. Uh, we need to really assert and be really clear that there's, I would say, actually three scales that global solidarity, global coordination, and then a demand, particularly in the United States, for a national government that is not an agent of uh, surveillance and, and repression, but of basic social democracy uh, is necessary. And then that thirdly, uh, there actually is going to be, both by necessity, a lot of policy innovation on the local level uh, in terms of, you know, we, we already see uh, that the head of the New York City Council is talking about a New York City UBI and things like that. Mm. I don't think it goes far enough, but you're going to, there's a, there's a bill in the New York State Senate to suspend rent for three months to those that are unemployed. You're seeing some of that policy incubation. And I would actually add to that things that maybe we've sort of, I think we've critiqued correctly from the kind of Marxist left in the sense that stuff like community supported agriculture and so on is great but it doesn't necessarily have a politics to it you know like okay goldman sachs doesn't care if you farm or whatever at the same time i actually think we need to get a much more serious conversation going of why shouldn't electricity companies be municipally and locally owned what how can we support both local businesses and worker cooperatives and how do we actually make our food supply chains more resilient so i think it's actually that kind of threefold thing of we're going to have a government we're still in a nation state model but it needs to be a decent open pluralistic and social democratic one we need to not be xenophobic and close in we need to have global coordination and collaboration this is i mean this is a great illustration of that um although it's not playing out that way, obviously, but we you know get to that later, but that needs to be our argument. And then actually we need to get uh, the impulse that is misdirected into nationalism and xenophobia. I think the one that we can pull out of it that is correct is some idea that, no, we need to actually have more control over our lives and not just be dependent on global supply chains 
uh, and corporate power. That is a correct impulse and it needs to be channeled in a democratic and resilient direction. And localism will be part of that, both in the policy and uh, you know, outside of government initiative level. Ah, sorry, I, I, I'm having some internet problems today. Um, I want us to talk in a moment explicitly about the stimulus package that was passed today, because I think that's you know relevant to a lot of the the topics that you've you've both just brought up. First of all, though, you're watching Tisky Sour, you're watching Navara Media. As you know, this show is only possible. This channel is only possible because of your kind support. Um, if you're already a subscriber, thank you very much. If not, please go to support.navaramedia.com and donate the equivalent of one hour's wage a month. Will give us a little bonus. I mean, I, I think as you as as you'll have noticed, we've been going every night this week. We're going to continue going more often than usual throughout this this particular crisis. One, well, one because we can't leave our houses, but also more more profoundly, um, because I think this is a more you know a, a time when scrutiny of of governments is more important than ever because there are so many lives at stake, and also with you know dramatic interventionist policies coming from the state this is when you know big political questions are at play and you know the next decades in in politics and economics across the globe could be determined by the decisions that are made over the next two you know two or three months and then year or so i'm also going to read a couple of comments i've got from yuppie prol nice name uh, a ten pound super chat. Thank you very much. Tiski is saving my life right now. Never has your coverage been more valuable. Got my neighbour into watching it, so a bonus on top of my monthly hourly wage sub. Keep it coming and stay safe, guys. Um, we love it if you get your neighbours to watch us. Very old school. Um, if you haven't, you know, if if this crisis hasn't yet brought you closer to your neighbours and you want to share this video in the more alienated way, uh, you can find a link in the YouTube description. Um, to a tweet to the show, retweet that. That gets more people uh, over here. Also like the video, obviously. Um, we are going to talk about that stimulus package. So Aaron, actually, you were talking earlier about how you know the United States hasn't done the kind of measures that we've seen from European governments in terms of wage replacement. Actually, when I was when I was reading through the stimulus bill today, I mean, obviously, a large part of it is corporate handouts, as you'd expect from any piece of you know American legislation. But there were also, you know, some, I mean, maybe generous is the wrong word, but, I, you know, I was surprised at how much um, the state was shoring up people's incomes. So some parts of it, everyone in the US is more progressive than the UK is going to get 1.2K, so $1,200 um, as a one-off payment. Nothing like that in the UK so far. And for the unemployed, um, everyone is going to get on top of their, well, if you're unemployed, you're going to get $600 a week from the federal government, which is to top up state benefits to try and get people's income up to about a thousand pound a week. So obviously America in normal times is incredibly stingy when it comes to unemployment benefits, but when it comes to responding to this crisis, they've actually been, well, it seems to me at least on the surface that they've been more ambitious than the British government. I, I'll go to you to, to Michael to see, maybe, maybe I've dramatically misunderstood what's going on. No, I, I no, I think that's that's true, and I think Sanders did some good work in the Senate. Um, I will say, you know, twelve hundred bucks is, you know, especially in you know New York is, I mean, it's nothing, right? I mean, <laughs> and I also think we have to look. I, I heard reports that, um, you know, in some states, all of a sudden, the the sort of like uh, you know property tax hikes might correlate. They might just be exactly twelve hundred dollars, as an example. Um, and without, say, as an example, dealing with rent, I mean, you know, this stuff will just get snatched up very quickly um, in, in most places. But, you know, look, it, it's very, very difficult. And I think it speaks to the structural disadvantage of the left because it, it just in just simply not having enough power. I mean, people need, need to get these resources now. There's no doubt about it. And what the bill mostly does, though, is we're talking about almost trillions of dollars. I mean, an unregulated slush fund, essentially, for Steve Mnuchin. And the types of goodies and benefits that we will be reading about for months. I think I, I just want to say, too, and, and, and I'm really keep trying to distinguish this point. There's my, you know, democratic socialist view of where we need to go and so on. And obviously, I don't share that, to say the least with the leadership of the Democratic Party. But we do need at least an opposition here. 
And what is extraordinary to me, I mean, I accept the vast ideological differences and I accept that Schumer and Pelosi and so on probably want most of these corporate giveaways themselves or happy to ride that gravy train. But the political malpractice, and, I, and let's just go really clearly to these folks' forebearers. Could you imagine Bill Clinton or Tony Blair or Barack Obama two weeks ago not coming out and saying, look, Donald Trump is criminally negligent. We're about to have thousands of people die. The economy is going to go into a massive recession. And we have you over a barrel. And, and maybe this is, and get, this is already where it gets ideological. But the big problem is not having two separate bills one that is an immediate human need bill, and the second that's a, okay, let's really determine what companies need to be bailed out and how bill, right? That's, that's the problem is because they're always holding the well-being of people hostage to the corporate uh, bailout. But you know the fact that Schumer and Pelosi couldn't even just say two weeks ago, look, we're gonna destroy you for this, and here is our totally modest uh, package, but necessary with beefed up unemployment uh, benefits and so on, and you better pass it now. Um, it's extraordinary. I mean, that's why we're in a situation where Donald Trump is at a 50 plus approval rating. And this is, and I'm somebody who's, I've never really, I, I think Trump, you know, is, is relatively, you know, he's not been thrown off course for years. I thought this was the first one last week. I think, okay, finally, this horror show might actually hurt his approval rating. Uh, at least beyond, you know, those who already don't like him, which is about half the country. And it hasn't. He's in the mid 50s. Can I can I I'll just respond to the, the, the approval point, um, sure. approval ratings point, which is, I think, look, it's too soon to say if you look at Iraq, Afghanistan wars, you know, the approval ratings for, for, for Bush and Blair uh, as those started was actually quite high. Uh, they actually went up a little bit after the intervention started because people in a time of national crisis or war get behind the leader of the country. Uh, 20 years later, $2 trillion in Afghanistan later, much, much more uh, than that in, in Iraq, thousands of dead people, you know, they are viewed as uh, historically wrong. They were, you know, they made huge historic mistakes. And, and I think, you know, with events of this magnitude, I don't think you can look at approval ratings on a week by week basis. We're going to see the full consequences of how um, Trump and Johnson will be judged as politicians six months, a year, 18 months from now. And, you know, in Britain, we're looking at for next year, a deficit of 9%. We're looking at debt to, debt to GDP going to levels which George Osborne in 2010 said, well, if that ever happens under a Labour government, it means we'll be bankrupt as a country. That's about to happen under a Tory government. Uh, and so I think the terrain has just changed so quickly. You know, you've got, like I say, 3.28 million new people claiming unemployment benefit. You've got potentially thousands of US businesses going to the wall. Uh, I so, think I think you've got to collect your thoughts. Whether you're Donald Trump or Nancy Pelosi or Bernie Sanders, I think it's going to take a month or two before people say, "You know what? This is how we should respond." You know, and that the same well, applies here, by the way. Yeah, I, I, look, of course, but my thing is, you know, we're we're playing with different timelines. In eighteen months, in twenty years. Donald Trump will, if we're still writing history, will be a historical disaster. I think Boris Johnson will probably be as well. In a short time frame, now look, it could get... Well, it's so an election year, isn't it? So, I mean, that's not quite true. You know, in six well, months' time... Year, but again, at some point, Aaron, and this is genuinely what disturbs me here, even, as, as, again, just regardless of ideology, there, there, Joe Biden is not able to do this he no i know that not. so nancy pelosi and chuck schumer have not provided in any way a serious alternative narrative so yes i and i don't even want to say and i don't want to hope this it is totally possible that things will get so objectively horrible that there just needs to be a consequence but you could not design a scenario where an opposition party lets uh, the the incumbent get away with something more than the one we're seeing right now. Right. And I, I and it and it's and again, it, it's just extra, it's extraordinary to me. And I would say too that by the same token, you're you're absolutely right. And by the same token, in a couple of weeks, 
if somehow miraculously this slows down a bit and the stimulus kicks in a bit and Trump is threatening again today that he's going to do the Defense Production Act for ventilators and Joe Biden is, you know, still figuring out his internet connection. There's a new story about Joe Biden that is not the stuff, you know, several months ago of him, you know, giving hugs. It's it's actually a very credible allegation. You know, we'll see how it's reported. It needs to be, you know, you know, it needs to be reported and responded to, but it's it's a serious allegation. And so you have that in the context of no unified opposition party message. Uh, and a candidate who, in addition to all sorts of things that can be picked apart in his record, does not seem capable of, you know, uh, of playing a plausible shadow president. So it, it's, it, it is a uniquely uh, disturbing situation. Can I ask you a question then? Sure. I'll be very quick. So even if unemployment was 25% come the next election by the end of the year, you think Trump would be re-elected re regardless? Well... I think that if unemployment is at 25% during the next election, every historical indicator would say that he would not be reelected. Mm. And so of course he could be defeated. What I'm also saying is that every historical precedent is that you have an opposition nominee who can speak. <laughs> uh, you have an opposition party uh, that would at least do a national campaign ad of the lieutenant governor of Texas saying that your granny should die so you go to work. How is he not the national face of the Republican Party is beyond me. And also, you know, and, and also let's, the other thing too is that if we go into the real nightmare scenario, I mean, how are we going to have an election in that time frame? You know, I mean, we've already got two two people with the Democratic, the DNC told people, oh, you know, go vote. Two election workers in Florida just came down with COVID. So there isn't a serious push towards mail-in voting nationally, which obviously needs to happen and would take care mm -hmm. of the, the, the problem. So look, I, of course, I, I Trump is absolutely beatable, but there is also a resiliency to his popularity and he's out uh, commanding, and of course, we have that you know that dual effect that you alert, alluded to earlier, which is a yes, if you expand the timeline, these atrocious leaders pay for their mistakes. But in the immediacy of the moment, you know, uh, George W. Bush, his intelligence failures led to 9/11. He literally told his briefers, "You okay, you guys, you covered your ass." That's what he said to the guys who briefed him about the 9-11 scenario. And then a couple of weeks later, he's with a megaphone speaking on the rubble and he's got a 90% approval rating. And that lasted for a while. Mm. And who knew Afghanistan and Iraq were disasters pretty quickly. It lasted him through re-election. I mean, another way you can look at it is that all, all leaders in power in this time of crisis seem to be getting a bit of a bounce. So we were speaking to David Adler yesterday about how Conte, the, the president or prime minister, prime minister, I think, of Italy is, you know, his approval ratings have rocketed during this crisis, even though it doesn't look like Italy are dealing with it particularly well. Here, Boris Johnson is incredibly popular, even though we've, you know, outlined many of the failures he has, you know, overseen during this particular crisis. And Trump, at least it seems to me, his popularity bounce has been fairly modest. Um, but obviously something you've been, you know, indicating is that the the success of Donald Trump throughout this process will in part be a function of the opposition up against him. So I want to take a little tour um, of of the kind of people who Donald Trump is, who are opposing Donald Trump. We're going to start with Bernie Sanders. Uh, so I suppose, well, but this is this is Bernie Sanders uh, during that debate about the stimulus package. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, the some of the schemes for unemployed people compared to Britain does look fairly generous. This was something that Republicans in the Senate were upset about. They were worried um, that if you gave people $600 a week, that could end up being more money than they earned when they were in employment. Um, so they saw that as both moral hazard and you know, just unacceptable. Um, this is Bernie Sanders arguing why that's a stupid idea. Republican colleagues are very distressed. They're very upset that somebody who's making 10, 12 bucks an hour might end up with a paycheck for four months more than they received last week. Oh my God, the universe is collapsing. Imagine that. 
Somebody who's making 12 bucks an hour, now like the rest of us, faces an unprecedented economic crisis with the 600 bucks. It's Bernie very charismatically arguing why, uh, you know, the lowest paid getting $20 extra than they might have got in their low paid job should not be one of our concerns when we're going into or as we're entering this 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 crisis as we're getting through it. Um, but obviously, in terms of the delegate count, it looks more likely that it's not going to be Bernie, but Biden, who is the candidate to face Donald Trump. And his interventions haven't been quite as articulate. This is him earlier in the week speaking to MSNBC. MSNBC. Why doesn't he just act like a president? That's a stupid way to say it. You know, Donald Trump was asked on... Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I probably best I don't. I just I just can't figure the guy. It's like, I don't know, it's like watching a yo-yo. I shouldn't have said it that way. It's like watching... It feels that way. I want to ask... I (laughs) want Oh, my God. Do you know what I'm saying, Aaron? Was that? I mean, watching watching that second video, it's not it's not Biden who you want to be the candidate, is it? Well, no, of course not. And and I I want to say too, I'm somebody who you know I was very annoyed most of the campaign because of this enormous. I mean, the Warren campaign was this horrible role in the race, and and people I think actually because we are in our bubbles, we're very naive about the appeal of Joe Biden. Uh, we can you know dislike him for all the obvious reasons we you know Iraq war and everything else but he has a popularity and he does have a certain kind of old school sort of political appeal and 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 I didn't you know it, up until Iowa I actually thought it was really a Bernie Biden race and even when you watch those whole clips I mean he really loses the plot and it's a problem I think there's other times where he's just used to a different mode of political communication that you know people uh, you know, certainly online are not going to relate to or understand at all. But the problem is, is like he can dominate a Democratic primary with older voters, but in a national election, older voters are going to Donald Trump. Mm. Uh, so, you know, you, you know, just even demographically, there does come this element of you do need that. It's been proved, you know, the Bernie coalition is not enough yet. And that's a major strategic problem for us that we have to work institutionally to overcome. And at the same time, it's big enough and powerful enough and significant enough that it needs to come out for the Democratic nominee. And again, I'm just speaking objectively here. I, I just don't see it. I, I would be shocked if, I, I'm sure there's conversations going on right now about you know a pinch hit with Cuomo. Uh, I want Bernie to still run aggressively. Uh, I think Bernie would in fact be a very formidable uh, candidate against Donald Trump. Um, but you know, we'll 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 see. I mean, you know, it, this election has proven, you know, the enormous power of of cable news and and uh, and and the democratic leadership in signaling uh, what is uh, permissible in terms of electability, and and they coalesced around Biden, and that convinced a lot of voters. You mentioned Cuomo there, who many of our audience won't have heard of. He's the governor of New York. Um, but he has he has come to prominence like in in this period because obviously he's the governor of the state that's been hardest hit, and I think you were saying probably before we go live that if if the Democratic establishment were to try and replace Biden with someone, and it does you know it, it is seeming increasingly just you know not plausible to put that guy up to be president. Um, it, it could be someone like Cuomo, but I want to go to a clip of him in a moment because it's also you know a key element of the of the political story uh, in terms of coronavirus in the United States, which is this battle between certain states and the federal government, or in this case, between Cuomo, the governor of New York, and Donald Trump, the president of the United States, obviously, um, about ventilators and the access of states to ventilators. We're going to have a look at Cuomo now. FEMA says we're sending 400 ventilators. Really? What am I going to what am I going to do with 400 ventilators when I need 30,000? You pick the 26,000 people who are going to die because you only sent 400 ventilators. 
So the, the the row there is 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 twofold. So one, Cuomo is is demanding that Trump send more ventilators from the federal stockpile of ventilators. Trump saying, you know, it doesn't need to send many. And the other is that he wants Trump to call in the Defense Production Act, which means that the presidency gets to you know demand that business turns its operations into producing ventilators. Before I go to you, Michael, I want to look at Donald Trump's response to this call from Cuomo. This was in that same phone in with Sean Hannity last night on Fox News. I have a feeling that uh, a lot of the numbers that are being said in some areas are just bigger than they're going to be. I don't believe you need 40,000 or 30,000 ventilators. You know, you go into major hospitals sometimes, they'll have two ventilators, and now all of a sudden they're saying, can we order 30,000 ventilators? So, look, it's a very bad situation. We haven't seen anything like it. But the end result is we got to get back to work. And I think we can start by opening up certain parts of the country, you know. I mean, fucking hell. I mean, one, obviously, there, there are many people who are going to be vulnerable to coronavirus in New York State who will, you know, find that horrific to listen to. On the other hand, I mean, that is a ready-made campaign advert to, you know, get rid of Donald Trump, isn't it? I mean, if it, we're going to see some really shocking scenes over the coming weeks. And it doesn't seem like Donald Trump, you know, has some grand political master plan when he's calling up to Fox News and saying people won't actually need ventilators. I mean, because pe people will need ventilators. This isn't something that's up for debate. No, I mean, and it's, and it's, a, it is a, it is a test between how resilient his cocoon is uh, versus this really serious objective reality. Although I, I do think, you know, there's a lot of, um, distorted bubbles in American politics. Andrew Cuomo substantively is awful. And I was talking earlier, I think about the Medicaid cuts and public hospitals he's worked to close down. There's definitely some other kind of, you know, sort of corruption questions that have floated around his administration. Uh, and then on the other hand, and particularly in the scenario Aaron outlined, where we're going, where, where it actually there's this some degree of normalcy in the sense of, a president f's up astronomically. The opposition wins. Uh, you know, Andrew Cuomo could certainly carry the ball across that field. You know, he knows how to do this, uh, and you know, just on that sort of objective level, from the perspective of the left and from the perspective of policy, uh, this is an atrocious, atrocious candidate. Um, but from the perspective of, you don't care about it but you actually would like to sort of run a serious campaign, uh, it seems to me just sort of an obvious play uh, in terms of a pinch hitter. Those of us who care about policy and the democratic forces of this country need to keep fighting hard uh, for Sanders. Uh, but I would think from the perspective of the sort of, you know, democratic establishment or whatever term we're using, I, I you know, it, 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 it plays to, it, it plays to all of their, feelings about politics, which is they basically just want somebody who can go on TV with Donald Trump and, you know, be like, hey, you're an asshole. And, you know, Cuomo can do that. So <laughs> I, I, I'm sure I would be shocked if it is not being considered. And I'm sure Andrew Cuomo is considering it. We're going to go to comments and questions in a moment. First of all, I just want to talk about, you know, one more issue, which is really going to divide the American response and the politics of coronavirus in the States to, to in Europe which is that whilst you know in, in this country the the effects of coronavirus are very much felt differently depending on what class background you are how big your house is how many family members you live with things we talked about previously on this show at least you know and and, and whilst we might have underfunded health services at least the ventilators which there aren't enough of aren't going to be rationed based on how much money you have mm. you you have private health care there is still 8.5 percent of the population who have no insurance at all is is it going to be politically sustainable for like the government to just let people die of coronavirus you know now now that it has been recognized as a national crisis which isn't anyone's fault can they just let people you know die of pneumonia on the streets well people already are dying uh you know we're seeing uh multiple reports of people dying because they don't have health insurance you know so it's happening and again this is the really important conversation about America is what is the relationship between what we find permissible? We already say it's permissible that tens of thousands of people die early deaths a year because of our healthcare system. This is another thing with Biden, and this is where I think practicality and ideology intersect. It's one thing to say you oppose single payer, and, and there was actually a, a very, there was a real tactical advantage to that in the primary. 
to say on national television at the midst of the beginning of an outbreak that he would veto single payer if he was president is going to start to be increasingly, I think, is going to be that signal to people of like, what the hell is wrong with you? And of course, we all know Donald Trump will... Look, if Donald Trump thinks that pretending he supports national health insurance is the way to go, he will start tweeting about how fantastic and wonderful, you know, Scotland is. That's his place. He likes Scotland. Um, so, uh, you know, I, it's it's very hard because I, I see, see countervailing forces. I see people demanding a hell of a lot more across the board and being absolutely disgusted and people really seeing that, that the Bernie agenda is the bare minimum of basic decency. And then I see, again, you know, the vice, the uh, the lieutenant governor of Texas saying grandparents should sacrifice their lives to their grandkids. And that doesn't indicate to me a national health response. <laughs> so, you know, it, look, but it, it's in flux. Um, and and uh, I am surprised, though, that even people a couple of years ago, like a Kamala Harris or a Cory Booker, uh, who politically positioned themselves as pro single payer, uh, I think clearly and sincerely, I'm actually surprised they haven't picked that mantle back up in this time of crisis. Uh, we're going to go to a couple of uh, questions and Aaron, jump in whenever you want. Um, Jason Baum of tweets on the hashtag Tisky Sour. How do we know voters are policy led enough or horrified enough by Fox's calls for human sacrifice? So Fox News is to demand a new economy post COVID. Biden's lead suggests a pining for status quo. Note many clapping the NHS are Tory voters. Was that clear enough? How... You know, I, I suppose it's it, it, it's it, is this crisis actually going to make people you know supportive Aaron, of? Wrong. Yeah, go on, Aaron. Yes, yeah, so I, I would say, look, uh, yeah, many people want the status quo, or as as Michael's already said, people want to go back. Democrats want to go back to two thousand and eight. Um, many people here would like to go back to two thousand and ten or the Olympics two thousand and twelve. But if we have in this country mass unemployment, by which I mean ten percent, uh, if we have a nine percent deficit which will mean austerity effectively was for nothing. We're back to square one. Uh, if we have high streets across the country reduced to nothing, you know, this really will be the coup de grace, I think, for offline retail, you know, which we've already seen for a long time, but this will be the final, uh, I think, the final sort of act. Uh, clearly, you can't carry on. And I, I, I actually, I think that's, it's implausible that there won't be a political reaction to this. My concern is, and I can only speak with any authority about this in Britain, is that conservatives like Rishi Sunak will say, you know what, the, the game in town now is a kind of more solidaristic economy, more funding to the NHS, solve the housing crisis and just leave everything else alone. Uh, and actually, if you're a Tory, I think that's the smart money. And so the worry is that the crisis uh, post-2008, now intensified with COVID-19, will lead to a realignment of conservative politics of the centre-right because the centre-left didn't want to play ball, because the centre-left actually is more committed to neoliberal orthodoxy than parts of the centre-right. You know, Macron, for instance, the things he's saying about how we'll, after COVID-19, we'll uh, give even greater resources to public health care in this country, as well as the kind of the pace setting he gave of all the G7 leaders in regard to looking out for the private sector. Macron's a, a centre-right politician. Now, France has that history of interventionist centre-right politicians, more than Britain or, or the United States. But to me, that probably augurs the future of centre-right politics. And like I say, that for, for me is the, is, the, is the biggest concern. I don't think anybody thinks realistically you can just carry on as usual in the US when you've got 3.28 million new people claiming unemployment benefit in one week. Nobody thinks we just go back to, you know, uh, December 2019. Uh, but I do think that the, the centre-right will grasp the situation uh, far more intelligently, and I, I think they'll probably make far more electoral uh, hay of it uh, than the left. That said, predictions are very hard because we're about to see something which could be bigger than the Great Depression. So I realistically, think, who knows? I, I agree completely. I think the only thing holding that back in the United States is just the there is still a raw lock of money on the Republican Party because every time mm. you think they're about to make this pivot, they have all the lane in the world you know, if you did the Steve Bannon formula, it mm -hmm. would be enormously successful and popular. And I actually thought 
there was a couple of days last week where Trump was talking about freezing mortgages and the Defense Production Act and and, the Repu and some Republicans like Tom Cotton, for God's sake, were getting to the left of Democrats on cash transfer. And I thought, OK, here it is. Um, what holds that back from happening is there still is actually this libertarian component that still exists. And there still is just a kind of raw funding mechanism um, that is holding back an expression of that. But it's very possible. And it's the obvious move for them to make. On the Democratic side, again, we have this incredible split between, you know, the there is a real insurgent social democratic energy. Uh, and those are, you know, those are the good people. Uh, what surprises me again with the with the kind of corporate mainstream Democrats, I'll, I'll mention a great villain of the show. I'm sure. I read uh, occasionally. I'll read an interview or watch a speech by Tony Blair. And by the way, I never know. You know, he's like a '90s buzzword machine. Uh, and I don't usually. It's it's actually relatively unclear what he's advocating in a fair amount of instances. Usually, some kind of modest uh, reforms, but he seems to be the, there is nobody equivalent in the United States who is even publicly saying, we want to preserve the center, we want to preserve this model, but it needs to change and adapt. So the reality of what you're saying, Aaron, is, is obviously true, and it's also in what Michael illustrated. Even as horrible as this bill, bailout bill is overall, it's doing things for people that is, is unprecedented and getting Republicans to vote for it. So of course we're going into new uncharted uh, territory, but we don't have a democratic center right nominee. And frankly, we don't have, you know, Barack Obama hasn't come out and said, here is my three phase address of how we update, you know, centrist politics for the 2020 pandemic age. Uh, it's, it's just not there. I'm not suggesting I'd like those answers, but it's incredible that there isn't even a framing of that in ideological terrain. It, they do seem fossilized. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose the the nature of the stimulus, I suppose, I think we, we made that kind of clear, is that it sort of pastes over all the contradictions because it is a, it's a short-term thing and they've just pumped out so much money that they can put in the same bill, a massive corporate handout and probably the most generous unemployment benefits that has ever been seen in the United States, the right? Thing is so, long -term. The co you think the corporate thing is longer term? Yeah, because well, yeah. the unemployment benefits have a time limit of four months. The corporate yeah. money, once you've wow. given it over, you've given it over. Millions of new giveaways and redistribution to that sector. That That is, that's structural. I mean, the aviation stuff is crazy. The loans right. being given to the aviation, they're basically, the federal government has basically said, until you are profitable again, we will cover you. I mean, this is nuts. People talk about the, the 70s and nationalized industry. You never got those kinds of handouts from central government in the 70s. And forget even, I mean, the things that you should ask for, like equity or workers on the board. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not even, there isn't even a mandate on not firing people. I think it's 10% in the short term. And I think four months out, have at it. Nothing on stock buybacks. It's pretty bad. We can completely change the subject. What is Michael Brooks' assessment of Boris Johnson? Um, I, he's just an incredible leader. I wish we had him here. No, uh, <laughs> and you I, wish him well. You wish he gets well soon. Yeah, I hope he gets well soon. I hope he can give uh, Bolsonaro and Trump big hugs. No, I think um, I actually think it's important to disaggregate between Johnson and Trump uh, for an American audience. I think Johnson is you know, loathsome. I think Dominique Cummings is one of the more disturbing characters in modern politics. I, it's not a moral judgment. I'll get that out of the way. And it's a tragedy. You guys don't have Corbyn. But I think that Johnson, this move of sort of moving somewhat to the left on economics um, and having a right-wing nationalism that is, of course, xenophobic and, of course, you know, carries with it horrific policy implications, but I think he much more plausibly than Donald Trump is doing the sort of like, no, 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 this is about nationhood. This is not about race. This is not, a, this is a different um, sort of kind of one nation message that folks that gravitate to that politics here who want to say they abhor and reject, and some of them do uh, reject racism 
uh, that they want to claim that just has nothing to do with what the Trump administration is doing or even Trump's rhetoric himself. So I think that Johnson has a more plausible way of, of sort of doing some populist economic moves and doing right wing and xenophobia in a way that has a lot more plausible deniability. Uh, and so I, I think it's it's something to get specific about if we're going to talk about it, because I think he's I think it's a little bit smarter and more effective, frankly. I mean, and, and you know, Trump has this bizarre charisma and, and does have real ability, but he's so grotesque uh, and the administration is so grotesque that it it holds certain things back. You know, there's there's no pl plausible deniability <laughs> around Trump. You know, I, I think there's. Plenty of people, uh, frankly, that would, they would like to like Trump. And if he could just tone it down a little bit, but at the end of the day, he can't. Which I suppose is why Boris Johnson could win the popular vote and, and Donald Trump can't, even though both of them are, are leaders. Aaron? Right. Yeah, no, I think Boris Johnson is far more likely to pivot to that that kind of realigned centre-right politics, post-crisis, post-pandemic, deglobalization kind of politics i think he can he can do that pretty well and i think he can lay the ground for people to come after him i think many of the kind of hard brexiteer people you know they've tended to be kind of free market libertarians i think you're going to hear a lot less of them uh because really their politics aren't uh particularly alluring uh in a world of high deficits high unemployment empty high streets uh, economic contraction uh, so i don't think trump offers that what i think trump probably is better than johnson he's more entertaining He's more captivating. He keeps himself in the news cycle. He's exceptionally good at that. Uh, but I, I do agree. They're not the same. And this is why I think a lot of the claims about Boris Johnson being a fascist and so on, I just think this is ridiculous. And I knew that was ridiculous. when This was con confirmed to me, actually, a, a few days ago when they had the send off for Jeremy Corbyn in, in the House of Commons. Maybe, maybe you saw this, Michael Brooks. Yeah. And, you know, Boris Johnson did the identikit public school thing of basically I've won. I'm I'm going to let you bow out of that humiliating you and being magnanimous and saying, oh, you're fantastic. You you know, you really care about the future of this country. That showed to me Boris Johnson isn't really a populist. Boris Johnson is a guy that went to Eton. He went to Oxford, uh, born to rule, blue blood, uh, and he is basically a, a political opportunist. You know, he was an opportunist before the crisis. He was an opportunist after it. You know, he was saying a couple of years after the austerity government came in, oh, the NHS should be reformed, it should be broken up. You know, now Boris Johnson is going to be the number one fan. He's going to be the NHS super fan. And you can make sure that it'll be a big part of his agenda to put more money towards the NHS. Why? He likes being popular. He wants to be reelected. But he isn't a fascist. Uh, and I think Donald Trump is far more of a sweet, generous, which means a kind of unique, maverick politician than, than Boris Johnson is. I just want to say one more thing before we go as well. We have, because Fox has already said to me to say this, we've got 1,635 people watching, only 742 thumbs up, smash the like button. We, we want to get people like Michael Brooks on even more. We can only do that uh, with your help and by sharing this content. So I expect a very world. high like rate during my appearance. What's that, Michael? I expect a very high like rate during my appearance. Yeah, let's get to 1,000 before the end of the show, just for Michael Brooks, please. Yeah. Yes. We are going to wrap up there, Michael Brooks. Thank you so much for joining us this evening hey. um, or afternoon for you. Um, I'm sure we'll get you back on very soon uh, to talk about your book when it comes out, but also, you know, to update us on the situation, what's going on over there. Um, Aaron, always a pleasure. My pleasure. Um, I suppose, I mean, our audience should check out the Michael Brooks show. I'm sure most of them know it already. But, you know, it's, out, Michael Brooks. very similar trains of thoughts in terms of, you know, political, political lefty, lefty, lefty podcast on YouTube. So check it out. Um, good night. Thanks, guys. Uh -huh.